P.S. I love you. Now, that's a popular way to end a love letter. I remember writing little love notes when I was in junior high school, and we passed them back and forth when we were supposed to be paying attention to other things. But what we would do there is pass these notes, and it was kind of a competition in a way to see who could take the longest to say goodbye. Oh, that was a measure of your love in a way. It was like, P.S., I love you. And then you'd write under that P.S.S., I love you, I love you. And then P.S.S.S.S., I love you, I love you, I love you, and then the infinity sign. I don't know if I was the only idiot doing these kind of things back in school, but you think about these things, that's what we were doing. That's what we were trying to express. And those two little letters at the end of the letter, they were P.S., standing for postscript. That's what that means, if you've ever wondered. And it's a way of expressing the fact that even after a lengthy letter that seems to say it all, where there's some things that are still unsaid, Still some things in the heart and head that didn't come out in the body of the letter. And so you add just that little bit more. That little thing on the end, P.S., I love you. And the letter to Romans, well, it is a love letter and it's no exception to that. After it ends, it doesn't end. If you'll take, with, uh, take a look with me at Romans 15, verse 30, that's where we left off last week. It says in Romans 15, verse 30, I read down through the end of that chapter there, it says, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, and that I could come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. And then verse 33, what a great ending this is. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Well, that's it for the study tonight. We're done. Pedro asked that I might finish out chapter 15, and I did. Okay, it's time to go home. No, it's not. Even though it says there, amen, some of you are already saying, this is my favorite Bible study I've ever been to. (laughs) Now, see, this kind of looks like the perfect place to end the book of Romans. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And whenever somebody says amen, you think, well, that's the end, right, in some ways. And you can almost hear kind of that sound, that sound of Bible cases zipping closed. Uh, Preachers, when they hear that, they know, okay, they're telling you it's time to go. And people getting ready to go out the door. And and so there's an amen here, and then, wait, there's more. There's more. Yes, there's much more. In fact, the love letter here that's called Romans, it has a postscript there. It has a postscript. It has a P.S. I love you. Chapter 16. And it's been said, maybe you've heard it, that when a preacher says, and in conclusion, you know what that means? It means absolutely nothing. That's what it means. It doesn't mean anything. And kind of in a way, that's what Paul's saying here. Amen. Now, let's keep going. And that's what he does. Chapter 16. And it's true that the book of Romans here, it's a logical book. It's a theological book, of course. It's got deep doctrinal truths, and we've looked at those, some big words along the way, justification, sanctification, glorification, propitiation. But you know what? It's also really just a love letter. And at the end, it's got this big P.S., I love you. You see, when we read it right, when we understand it well, Romans is no dry doctrinal document here. It's not just some old dusty book. No, in fact, Romans is really a romantic love letter. From God to us. And the letter is passionate. It's personal. And Romans here tells the story, the most important story, the story, the most important love story of all, which is the God who so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. He was willing to die on the cross for our sin that we might live happily ever after with him. Now, that may, might sound to some to be a fairy tale, but it's not. It's better than any romance that anyone could read. And see, in the first 15 chapters here of Romans, what you see is Paul the persuader, Paul the pastor, Paul the preacher, Paul the poet even, as he just pours out his heart through the Holy Spirit to us. But now in this last chapter, we see Paul the person. And I think that's an important thing to see, and apparently God did too. See, Paul ends this letter here with a bunch of personal P.S. I love you's to his friends, and from his friends. And I find that fascinating, and you might ask why. Why is that so shocking? Why is that so important? Well, remember, this is God's word that we hold in our hands. Sometimes we forget that, but this is a holy, sacred book. God's very word to us, the Holy Bible. 
And this is the book of Romans, and any scholar will tell you, hey, the book of Romans is one of the central and important books of the New Testament. A book that was written to present the gospel in all of its clarity and glory. And Romans clearly lays out the most important message that has ever been told to anyone anywhere. And it gets sent out, and it's the way to salvation. It's the way to eternal life. I mean, certainly that is an important message. And even non-Christian scholars recognize this book's importance in human history. They consider it to be one of the most impressive and influential writings of all time. And so it has literally shaped human history. We are where we are today largely because of the thoughts and ideas that are here in the book of Romans. But think about this carefully for just a minute. An entire chapter of this divine document is devoted to Paul basically saying, Howdy to his friends. Now, to put it in today's terms, it's kind of like Paul's giving a shout out to his homies. That's what you see. You see the sacred scripture spending time in that? Doesn't that seem a little strange right at first? What is God trying to tell us through this chapter? Again, an important book. Scrolls were very expensive. You didn't waste paper, and yet you see Paul here putting these things down and taking the time to do it. What is God trying to tell us? Well, I believe he's trying to tell us the same thing my mom used to tell me all the time. She used to say, Scott, you will be known by the company you keep. Show me your friends, and I'll tell you who you are. And I hate to admit it, but my mom was right about that and some other stuff too. But see, in life, as she would tell me so many times, we don't just make friends. Our friends make us. See, the kind of friend you are is the kind of friend you'll have. And we are really, in a way, the sum total of our relationships, our relationship with God and our relationship with others. That's what our life will amount to in the end. That's what will be left in eternity. And why does Romans 16 matter so much to us tonight? Well, it does because this chapter here has a lot to say about where and how to find true and lasting love in our lives. Friendship, companionship. Connection, belonging, family, all of the things that really, when people lay there on their deathbed, that's what they're thinking about. And I would venture to say that many of you here in this room know exactly what it is to be lonely even in the midst of a crowd. I read an article the other day and it really hit me hard. I I have been thinking a lot about it since I saw it. And it, it was a recent study that showed that fewer and fewer people are reporting that they have any real friends at all. The title of the article was, Is Your Circle of Friends Shrinking? And a major sociological research group out of the University of Chicago had been tracking data since the 1970s, the early 70s, and they reported during that time a rapid decline, a decisive decline in the quality and quantity of relationships that people had. You see, during that time, they would ask this and among other questions, which is how many close friends do you have, including family members, with which you can be open and honest about important issues in your life? Something that matters most to you, someone you could open up to about those things. In 1985, the average answer was three, three close friends. Now, that alone made me say, wow. But then it went on, 2004. By 2004, the average answer was two, two friends. Now, even more disturbing than that to me was that one out of four People in the United States reported that they did not have any close friends at all. Zero. We're talking friends or family. Now, remember that that phone thing that was about friends and family? This is a person who has no one in their friends and family thing. They they look on their phone, and it's, it's Sprint is the only one to call, you know? And you think about that. No one to confide in, nobody to open up with, no one to share life's joys with, nobody to share life's sorrows with. Acquaintances, yes, maybe co-workers and all the rest, but friends, no. Now, in a separate article that came out about the same time, Miami was recently voted one of the least friendly cities (laughs) in the country. Now, that made me want to take some of my friends, my three friends or two friends or whatever it was, and find the guy who wrote that article and punch him in the nose for saying such a thing about this fine city. But the thing is, the truth is, we are on edge here, aren't we? In many ways, people don't know who to trust. They're watching everyone kind of closely, and that attitude can spill over even to the church. You know, you get here and you forget, hey, I'm here. And someone says hi to you, and you go, what's your problem? 
what do you want? You got one hand on your wallet, you know, wait, ready to take them down if you need to. And you say, wait, I, all I said was hi. Did you like, want a bulletin? And so you think about it. God didn't come to have us live life alone. See, that's an important thing to see in the scripture. He put us in a family. He placed us in a family. He calls it the church, but it's not a building. It's a spiritual circle of people who matter to each other, people who will love us, people who will be loved by us. And here's what's interesting, that many people will come into a church and still hide. Oh, they... A place like this, and uh, you know, especially on Sundays when it can get really crowded in here, it can be the kind of place that you can come in and out of, and maybe nobody even knew you were there, or that you didn't know they were there. But you know what? You have to take the time to actually see what the church was meant to be in God's Word. And this is the main point of tonight's teaching. If you're taking notes mentally or on the page, it's that the best friends you will ever find in life are those that you will find following Jesus. The best friends you will ever find in life are those you will find following Jesus. And a person who follows Jesus and serves him with all of their heart will have many, many friends. In many cases, they'll feel like they have too many friends. But true friends, real relationships. And the issue won't be, I don't have enough friends, but it'll be, I don't have enough time to spend with all of them. And that's when the promise of eternity starts to really take hold of our hearts. And we say, yes, this is just a foretaste of what heaven's going to be like, eternal friends, forever friends with the Lord and with each other. That's the kind of life we were meant to live. And see, maybe some of you are already following Jesus and serving him in some capacity in your life, and you know exactly what I'm talking about, and you say, yes, I know what you mean with that. I have many friends here and elsewhere, and our common bond is Christ, and I would have no shortage on my list of people who matter to me, and I matter to them. But you know what? Others in this room maybe even would say, wait, that's not it. That's not it for me. See, I feel very alone even here tonight, here in this crowd. And I suggest that the lesson we need to learn from Romans 16, all of us need to learn it, is that if we really want to find friends and if we really want to be friends, we have to follow Jesus fully. Not from afar, not from a distance, but really getting in close to him because, see, Jesus is surrounded by family, surrounded by friends, surrounded by people who love him and love anyone who he loves and the best friend you will ever find the best friends you'll ever find are those you find following jesus see we can learn a lot about the type of person paul was just by looking at the types of friends that he made in romans 16 we see 26 specific names here faithful friends in rome and not only these names that he does but also he just shorthands some groups and and some families there and says say hi to all that that group there not just acquaintances here it's clear through the language he uses that these are friends that these are people that he's close with and this is especially remarkable because in those days it was a little harder in some ways they didn't have all of the uh video chats and uh emails and all the things that sometimes we can stay in contact with people on no you see for paul many times he wouldn't see people for years and in this place, in Rome specifically, he hadn't even been there yet. And yet his travels with the Lord had brought him across the path of many people. And they became friends, sometimes very quickly, but deeply. And that's what you see can happen when somebody has that common bond in Christ. See, a friend of his is a friend of mine and vice versa. And you start seeing those things here. If Paul was a modern minister, if he was a modern-day Christian, you know, these would be the people who were on his Palm Pilot there. These are the guys who are on his speed dial, you know, with just one button he can get a hold of them, or the uh, iChat list, the buddy list there, that he just wants to shoot them a quick thing. And you see that people, in those days, they may not have had that, but Paul did have a connection that he formed with people. He literally had hundreds of, I mean, this is just one small letter. You see other names mentioned in other places. One small letter of the hundreds of deep, significant friendships that Paul had with people from all backgrounds and walks of life. And you might say, well, of course he was the Apostle Paul. Of course he got to know people that way. But remember, these people got to know him, and they got to know each other. And there was a camaraderie there. And this is absolutely crucial. All the friends that Paul made and had in life really stemmed out of one major friendship in his life see when he became friends with jesus his whole life blossomed what were his friends like before a bunch of pharisees have you read the gospels do you want to be friends with a bunch of pharisees that's what paul was 
He was a judgmental, critical, violent, insolent man, the Bible says. He's the kind of guy that you wouldn't want as a friend. And he wouldn't have had any real friends. But Paul turned around because Jesus touched his life. And see, people in our society, they tend to form friendships around the wrong kinds of things. Things that aren't really that important when the truth is told. And so there are many fair-weather friends. You know, they're really just forming a friendship about something superficial. And they become fair-weather friends because maybe they're like fair-weather fans. You know what I'm talking about? An example here, the Miami Dolphins. Oh, some of you are saying, please don't go there. But you know what, my friends, I have to. Because there will be many of you, maybe even this weekend, out early scraping Miami Dolphin stickers off of the bumper of your car. Just saying, I, I don't want anyone to know that I had ever any interest in them or anything else. Giving away your collectibles, dolphin stuff, you know, you'll be handing it out on eBay if anyone wants to buy it or any of that kind of stuff. And the whole problem there is that a lot of times people say, I only like you when you win. If you're not winning, I don't like you. And I don't want to be around my friends. Now we're all mad and we're all mad at each other. We're not even friends anymore. We don't want to come over and watch a Dolphins game. We did. That's the only thing we had in common. We don't like each other anymore. And you think about this. There's nothing wrong with having sports or hobbies or other interests in common. Of course, I'm not saying that. But the point is this. If there's nothing of any greater significance at the center of our lives than that, then we're not going to have anything to gather around that really has any long-term importance. See, if people chase the God of money, well, then that's what they gather around. But that's really no God to gather around. And the kind of friend that you are is the kind of friend that you'll have. And see, if you have Jesus as a friend, the kind of friend you'll be is the kind of friend you want in life, the kind of friend you want to have. And see, if you're a selfless person, if you're a generous person, if you're an honest person, if you're open with your life, if you're focused on eternal things, guess what? You're going to tend to be attracted to other people who want those same things in their life. And those are the kind of faithful friends you want in life. Those are the kind of people that you want to do life with. And the best friends that you will ever find in life are the people you find following Jesus. Now, let's meet some of Paul's friends. As we see there in verse 1 of chapter 16, it says, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Chentria, that is close to Corinth there, where this letter was being written from. And you see in verse 2 it says, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she's been a helper of many and of myself also. Now, stopping right there, I think one of the things that we see right away is that this indirectly addresses one of the complaints that many people have about Paul's writing. They say, oh, Paul, he's a pig. He's a chauvinist pig. You know, he... Didn't he write that whole thing about wives submit to your husbands and all the rest of that? Wasn't that him? Yes, that was him. But you know, nothing could be further from the truth than that Paul was a chauvinist. See, Paul was downright radical when it came to his culture in the positive treatment of women, as was Jesus, the person he followed. You see, a full third of the people who are listed in this chapter right here are women. And Paul is extremely complimentary of them. And you see, in fact, the very first person that Paul mentions in this list of friends here, he says Phoebe, and that's a female name. And the context suggests that Phoebe's actually the person who carried this letter from Corinth to Rome. Now, think about that. Paul's here in Corinth. He would like to go see the people in Rome. He already said that. He writes this letter, which is, again, containing the most important message that could ever be carried Lives would literally be turned from eternal death to eternal life as a result of this letter. And who does he call on to give it to? Well, he calls a faithful friend and says, Hey, Phoebe, could you take this for me? See, it's impossible to overestimate the importance of this letter here in, in Romans. Heaven will be packed with people. Some people who've even come to the Lord during the study here in Romans because of these words. Coming to faith in Jesus through the message of this letter, huge responsibility, huge, huge. Can you imagine if Phoebe had lost the letter? Oops, where did I put that scroll? I knew it was here somewhere. Hmm. Well, uh, wow, that's okay. I'll just make up something of my own. You know, writes a little something. No, you see her being a faithful person, somebody who Paul could trust 
Somebody who was given this privilege of this life-changing letter here, and her name means radiant. See, it's important to even think about that. She lived up to her name. Paul calls her here a sister, a servant, a saint, a helper, it says in verse 2. That is the word literally patron. It means somebody who uses her means for ministry, somebody who uses whatever she's got in life to support and take care of those who are doing God's work. And so you see here Phoebe may have been wealthy. She probably was from this context, but she cared more about storing up treasures in heaven than she did about storing up treasures on earth. And so she's taking a business trip, in essence, to Rome. And Paul says, hey, while you're on the way, I got something even more important than anything else you could be doing. And you see through this that I think it's important to point out Phoebe was not just a church goer. She was the kind of person that the church would go to. She was a go-to person. You know those? Maybe you have them at at your office. Maybe you're that person. That'd be great if you are. But the person that when you want something done and you want it done right, you go to that person and you do it. And there's other people that you go, don't give it to them. They'll lose it for sure. And so you see Phoebe being one of those people who was a go-to person, not a bench warmer, not a pew potato, not a slip in and out on Sunday kind of person. No, she was the kind of person who it says here she was a servant in the church, meeting needs, reliable, faithful, involved, with what was going on. And she used her gifts, she used her abilities. Out in the world, yes, she was a capable person. But inside, she was also doing those things too. She used those things for the furtherance of the gospel. And Phoebe had faithful friends. Why? Because she was a faithful friend. That's how, you know, sometimes people say, oh, God never uses me. You know, but Paul knew Phoebe. Why? Because Phoebe had been around and doing things and involved and and having those things available. And so, you see... The best ability is availability, and that's what Phoebe had. Now, Phoebe was leaving to go to Rome. She's a new face in a new place, and you think about this. That's a tough thing to do. Rome's a big city. I went there once by myself, and uh, I was a teenager at the time, or young 20s, and I was overwhelmed by the city. I didn't know anyone. I didn't speak the language. It was really a pretty stupid thing to do, but there's Phoebe, you know, coming into Rome, and she doesn't know anybody, really. But Paul gives instruction to the Romans. Look at what it says. It says, be a friend to Phoebe because she's been a friend to me and to many others. I can bet you that Phoebe wasn't lonely for long in Rome. Why? She came with a great recommendation because she had a great reputation. And when you serve the Lord, that's the kind of thing that happens. See, you'll make friends fast. Because people who've known people for years will say of you, hey, this is a person you can trust. This is a person you want to know. This is a person that you should accept. And Paul knew and Phoebe knew that the best friends you'll ever find are those you find following Christ. That's where you're going to find true and faithful friends. Now, you see in verse 3, it says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Now, this is an important couple here that's being mentioned in verse 3. It's Priscilla and Aquila. And they're a Christian couple, and Paul calls them fellow workers. Paul met this couple in Corinth, we know from the Scriptures, and they were then kind of exiled from Rome at the time, and, and obviously they were here returned to Rome at this point, their place of origin. And you see him saying... Hey, make sure you say hi to them. Great example of what a godly marriage here is all about in Priscilla and Aquila. And not a lot is said about them in the Scripture, but what is said about them, they're always ministering together. They're always together. They're always doing things together. And you see, one of the things that I think is so important for us to underline here, which is that marriage was meant to be ministry and not misery. See, a lot of people think, oh, marriage, it's misery. No, it was meant to be ministry. And I think the problem that a lot of people do is they spend so much time just staring at each other and finding fault with each other, when if they would go out and serve together, they might find that they just could give each other a lot more grace. See, one of the best ways to to, uh, have a good marriage is to serve together. It's one of the things my wife and I do. We like to serve together. And Finding something that you can do to serve together. Now, some of you right away would say, but uh, you don't understand. My spouse doesn't want to do this or whatever else. Well, understand that this is God's plan. This is God's purpose for what marriage is supposed to be about. And so what you can do is pray toward these ends and work toward these ends and see as the Lord will do those things in times. But finding something that you can do together to serve God as a couple. Maybe team teaching children's ministry. You know, you can tag team it. When the kids get you down on the ropes, hey, your wife can come get you up, you know, and and tag you and she's going to save you from those things. Team 
maybe as a, a, a husband and wife greeters, you know, you can take the ones from the left door and she can take the ones from the right or whatever. Hosting a small group in your home are these things or delivering meals to the sick together. All of those things. It, it doesn't have to be something huge, but ministering together is one of the greatest things that you can do in a marriage. And if you're single here tonight, let me give you a little tip. If you're hoping to get married someday, if you're thinking about it, you want to meet a mate. You know what you want to do? Look for people who are actively serving the Lord during their single season. Why? Because the best friends you'll ever find in life are found following Christ. And you know what? If they're not following him now, they're probably not going to follow him then. And you don't want to have somebody who's not following the Lord that you're yoked together with. See, the great thing about that is you look at it and you say, man, you want to marry your best friend. And where are you going to find your best friend? Following your real best friend, Jesus. See, I've been married 17 years now to Lynn, and I can say she is my best friend next to the Lord. But you know what? The first five years of our marriage weren't at all like that because we weren't following the Lord. We thought we had found friendship in each other. We thought that's what was going to make it for us. And you know what? It didn't work. And what needed to happen, what desperately needed to happen is what did happen, which is my wife fell in love with another man. And that other man was Jesus Christ. See, that's a great thing when that happened. And I did the same on the same day even. And you know what? We became followers of Jesus. And in that, our friendship flourished. Our friendship began to be what it was supposed to be as we decided, hey, we don't want any more miserable marriage. Let's have a ministry marriage. Let's have a marriage that's focused on other people, not thinking about ourselves so much. Because when we think about ourselves, we get miserable. It's just the way it works. And so that's why Jesus was saying, I want you to be others-oriented. Why? So we'd be unhappy? No, so we'd find happiness. Because he said, the more you think about you, the sadder you will be. And so you want to marry a person who loves the Lord. If you're single here, you want to marry a person who loves the Lord more than they love you. See, a lot of times they say, oh, I just want someone to love me. Well, that would be okay. But what you really want is someone who really loves Jesus. Because if they really love him more than they love you, guess what? Some days you're not going to be that lovable. I know you find it really hard to believe that I'm not that lovable every single day. But ask my wife, every once in a while, I'm not that lovable. But guess what? She continues to love me because she loves Jesus more than she loves me. And that's what sustained us through those times. And here's the key. It works both ways, you see, that you don't just look for another person who loves Jesus. Let me look for a person who loves Jesus so they'll love me. No, the whole thing is you want to be a person who loves Jesus, because that's the kind of match that's going to get made in heaven. You need to fall in love with Jesus first before you try to love another person, because see, he's really lovable. He's easy to love. You can practice on him. And then when you, your spouse comes along and it's a little more difficult, well, you'll have some practice. So it's good to love the Lord, serve people passionately, and don't be surprised when God, you look over and you find that God has put a person there in your life to serve alongside, to have that ministry synergy, that, that two people will be able to serve him more effectively than one. That's one of the ways you can know whether a person is right for you. Sometimes people ask me things like that. How can I know? One of the ways you'll know is that you serve and love the Lord more effectively together than apart. If that person pulls you away from the Lord, they're not for you. They're not God's plan for you. And that is what it is to have someone who's a friend and more than just a friend that will be faithful for life. That's what God wants for us, but this is the way it happens. Marriage is it's meant to be. And six times here you see Priscilla and Aquila. They're named here, and her name comes first four of the, out of those six times. Now, again, you might say, what does that matter? But every word in God's word matters, and everything in here matters. And you see that in those days, this just didn't happen. I mean, to have the wife's name go first it was a patriarchal society it was one in which the man's name would have come first ordinarily and so apparently Aquila had a very gifted wife Priscilla and apparently he wasn't threatened by that and it didn't really bother him that every time somebody pinned her name they put her first and the couple here was interacting uh, very much with different people. And you see them instructing a man named Apollos in the scriptures. And he was one of the most effective teachers in the church. And so these were obviously a very gifted couple. And they risked their life for Paul. Isn't that a great thing? It says it there in verse 4. They laid their neck out for him is what it literally says. 
And Paul had many friends, but he had many foes too. And sometimes if you were a friend of Paul, it meant you were also getting all of his foes. And he had many. And see, if you're going to be a friend of Jesus, guess what? You get all his enemies too, and he has many. He has many friends, but he has many enemies. So one of the things that you'll see here is this is a person willing to risk their life for another person. Somebody saying, hey, I'll take the bullet. I'll take some of the punches for you tonight. That's what you see them saying. And you see in verse 5, it says, greet the church that's in their house. Greet my beloved somebody, Mr. E, who is the first fruits of Acacia to Christ. Now, I know Paul was a people person because he remembered the names of these people. I can't even pronounce them, and he remembered them. I don't know why he didn't have any normal friends like Bob or you know, something like that. But you see church in their house here. That's an important thing to think about. Sometimes people think that a church is a building. You know, we had that little thing growing up. It was, this is the church, this is the steeple. Open it up and see all the people. You know, did you ever do that? And the truth is, if you think about it more from a Calvary Chapel perspective, it's like, this is the church. Where is the steeple? No, open it up. The church is the people. See, you think about that. The church is the people. It's not the building. You don't go to church. The church goes to the building. And so what you're seeing there is small groups. You're seeing families. You're seeing houses that were open as churches. And you know what? We organize some small groups here. There are some ones that are formalized and everything else, but it doesn't all have to be that way. You know, sometimes people, oh, I wish the church were more personal. Then make it more personal. Open your houses, open your homes to one another. You know, and you say, well, wait a minute. You know, people, this isn't a friendly city. Didn't didn't you read the study? I mean, this is Miami. Weird things will happen. Oh, yeah, some friendly weird things will happen. But you know, The church is as friendly and as personal as we make it. That's the truth. Hospitality. I'll never forget a couple, kind of like a Killa and Priscilla here. They they were in our lives. His name was Martin. His wife's name, Melissa. And Lynn and I, we went over to their house. We were brand new believers. We walked into a Calvary chapel, and we didn't know anybody, anybody. We went there, and we were like, Wow, okay, well, as soon as it's over, let's run out the door, you know, so that nobody dives on us. And, and you see, Martina and Melissa just stepped out of their comfort zone. They, weren't, they didn't have a title. They didn't have a position. They just simply said to us, hey, you guys have plans for lunch? No. Would you like to come over to our house? Yes. <laughs> you know? And so the, it was that simple. And what happened is we went over to the house, and he was a musician, and he played a lot of music for me in different Things and I see I'd come out of the world and I loved music, but I hadn't heard any Christian music I liked. And I went over to this guy's house and he he showed me, hey, there's there's actually some decent stuff out there. Wow, this was awesome. You know, and they cooked for us and all the rest. And it was just an amazing, amazing time. And so I encourage you to do this on a basis as the Lord just leads to say, hey, invite one another over. Take a risk, be friendly. See, that's all it, it's asking us for here. In verse five, it says, My beloved Eponia, first fruits. First fruits. You know what that means? That means the very first convert he ever had in Asia. Now, Paul converted or spoke to the multitudes many times. I mean, thousands upon thousands of people came to know the Lord through him. It's kind of like a Billy Graham-ish type ministry where there's just somebody who's had an effect on a ton of people. But he said, you know, I, I still remember this very first guy who came to the Lord in Asia. And he names him there. And, and I'll never forget in my life the very first person I ever personally sat down with and prayed to accept the Lord. It was just an amazing thing. To this day, a great friendship there. And you know what was the most amazing thing there is I got to see his life begin to affect other people's lives. That was unbelievable. It's fascinating. It's exciting. That's why Paul had such a passion for people because he saw that every person can affect so many more. And I can affect people that I'll never even meet simply by affecting one. What a great mindset that is for us to have. And he says he was beloved. And then he says, greet Mary who, who, greet Mary who labored much for us. Now, this is verse 6 here. Maybe some of you know CCR. This is not proud Mary. We know that. This is humble Mary. And it's, there's a list of a lot of Marys in Scripture. You see, they, they don't use a lot of last names here, and, and, and that's kind of hard for us sometimes. It's kind of like here at the church. There's some people that I've known for years, and I have no idea what their last name is still, you know. Uh, but you think about we have a lot of Georges here at the church. Now, we especially have a lot. If you're George here tonight, God loves you just the same. I want you to understand that. It's not, 
anything against you. But here's the thing. We have lots of Georges here, and we have a bunch in the office. We have a small office, a small staff, but three of them are Georges. Now, people call here all the time, and let me just ask you, please, if you know their last names, please just say it. Because what happens is people, I, I answer, and they say, hey, is George there? Yeah, Georges are here. <laughs> Which one would you like? Well, I don't know. They don't know their last name. Well, what is he like? Well, um, he's nice. Okay. <laughs> that eliminates two of them. No. It, <laughs> but, but you look at it, and it, we're friends, I can say that. But you think about those things, and, and Mary here, he just says, in the church in Rome, or the people in Rome, you don't think there's maybe more than one Mary, or Mary that people would think about, or whatever. So you see here, and they say, hey, say hi to Mary. Mary? You mean Mary, the mother of Jesus? That Mary? No, she's not there. She's in Jerusalem. Oh, oh yeah, well, Mary Magdalene? No, it's not Mary Magdalene. I've heard of her. Mary, the sister of Lazarus, the one whose brother came back from the dead? No, that's not her. Just, just Mary, Mary from Rome there. And see, this is what's important to see is that Mary, though she had a common name and maybe she thought of herself as a common person, she didn't have one of these funky names that you knew for sure who they were talking about. I mean, when they talked about some of these guys, there was only one of them. But Mary, there might have been more than one. But guess what? Mary made it into the book. And I think that's so important to see because you know what? Some of us think, hey, you know, God doesn't even know my name. God doesn't even know what I'm up to. Nobody knows my name. Nobody can remember my name. But, you know, God here, through this very simple thing, I think of just using a common name, is showing us, you know what, P.S., I love you, and I know who you are, and I know what you've done, even if others don't, because Paul remembered Mary. He knew many Marys, but he just says, hey, tell Mary, I recognize her work, and I remember it. I'll never forget it. And again, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit here to instruct us, to show us that, hey, God never forgets the work that we do, even if other people don't even know our name or remember what we've done. It says that she worked hard, she labored much. You know, Paul was a hard worker. So if when Paul says someone's a hard worker, they're a hard worker. If, if someone lazy says, wow, that person works a lot, you know. No, this is Paul, a hard worker, saying she works hard. She really distinguished herself. But God knew her name, and he recognized her work. And verse 7, it says, greet Andronicus. That sounds like someone from Star Trek to me. That's one of those names. I'm sure there was one, Andronicus. And Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Now, I'm just going to call him Andy, if you don't mind. He's a friend of Paul's. He's a friend of mine. So we're just going to call him Andy. But Andy and Junia here, another husband and wife team. This is male and female name. And they had been in prison at some point with Paul because he says, my fellow prisoners. Now, Paul wasn't in prison at this point. He was in Corinth. But he's saying, hey, part of our past, part of our bond here, there's nothing like suffering to help you make fast friends. You know, it's amazing how well you can get to know somebody in a foxhole. And so here he is in a, a dungeon, and, and he would have certainly gotten to know them fairly quickly. And one of the th things he got to know with them is that they knew Christ before he did. That's what he says there. They were in Christ before me. Now, why is that significant? I think it's significant for two reasons that are worth pointing out, which the first is that Andy and Jun Junia here had followed the Lord for at least 25 years, because at this point, that's about how long Paul had known the Lord. So they were some senior saints, maybe. And it's good to have some long-term friends uh, long-term believers as friends. You know, sometimes people like to hang out only with their own age group, but you see Paul being a person who would hang out with people from all areas. You see him with men and women. You see him with couples and singles. You see him with people who are of older age, people who are of younger ages. You see him with uh, those who were wealthy, those who weren't wealthy at all. So Paul had many different friends and a wide circle of those. And some people do just kind of say, hey, I, you know, I want to keep the generation gap. But no way. That's a mistake. See, it's good to have people that we look up to. And one of the things I look up to is someone who's walked the road longer than I have. See, the longer I follow the Lord, the, longer, the more I realize what it is to follow the Lord for a long time. Oh, I've met many flash-in-the-pan believers, many, whoa, that was an amazing six months kind of believers. But people who have walked with the Lord consistently for 40, 50, 60 years, I start saying, now that's a person I want to talk to. I want to find out how to finish well. I can see how to start well. I want to finish well. I want to see what that's about. And that's one of the things that Paul was wise to do. And I like it about Pastor Pedro, my friend, because he's a person who has intentionally sought out mature 
believers, people who have walked in the Lord longer than he has. And you think about it, many of the guest speakers that we've had, and people always go, wow, where do you get these guys? These are phenomenal. You know what they are? They're people who Pedro has, has sought out as mentors to say, guys, I want to know what it is to follow the Lord for a long time. That's a wise thing to do in your own life. There are people here who have known the Lord longer than you have, however long you've known the Lord. And so you see those things, and Paul was wise to do it. He was a very uh, learned man, but he sought out friends who knew more than he did. And I also believe Paul mentions this with Andy and Junia because, you know, if you remember what Paul was doing before he came to Christ, I think this speaks a whole lot about their character, not just Paul's character. See, it says a whole lot about their ability to forgive and to embrace former enemies. See, this is a big part of what it is to be a friend because a lot of times people will hurt you in some way or they've done something in your past and people say, that's it, and their circle gets narrower and narrower. It's everybody who's never done anything wrong to me. Well, let me tell you, that's going to be a very small circle and eventually even you're going to have to stand outside of it because you're going to do stuff to yourself. And in my life, if I'd done all the stuff I've done to myself, I wouldn't be my friend. You know, but you think about it, you got to learn to forgive. You got to learn to forgive. And what is it that Paul was doing? Well, you may remember he was a destroyer. He was a persecutor of the church. He was one of the guys throwing people into prison. Who knows but what some of the friends and family and loved ones of these people right here that he was friends with had been persecuted by Paul directly or indirectly. And so you see, in this case, they obviously prayed for Paul. They obviously embraced him as a friend in spite of the fact that he had been a very advocate, a very active enemy of theirs in the past. And what an example that is to us. Because God can turn our worst enemies into friends. But a lot of times, we're the ones resisting it. You know, we see him doing something, and well, God may forgive him, but I won't. You know, and all the rest of that stuff. But you know what? Some of the best friends you will ever find are those you find following Jesus. And guess what? Some of the people you find following Jesus were just as bad as you were, and even worse sometimes. And you know what? If we can't forgive them, we can't be friends with them. If God is willing to forgive them, we need to be able to do those things as well. And so you see verse 8 here, it says, Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Now, I got to laugh at this because the, the guy's name means large. I mean, it, ample is what it means. You know, my buddy, ample. Now, this is something I've learned in life. It's good to have big friends and small enemies. I don't know if you've learned that yet, but back in school, I learned this one because I wasn't the biggest kid on the block. And so I like to form friendship with the big guys. You know, hey, this is my buddy, ample. I'd like you to meet him here. You know, this is him here. And it's wonderful when you have that big friends and small enemies. And Paul's name even means little and so here you got little and ample hanging out together. A wonderful thing. Now, it says, greet Urbanius, our fellow worker in Christ, verse 9. And ah, Stachus, Stachus, my beloved. Now, notice the recurring theme that you see in here. Work, labor, serve. It's all throughout here. Now, I, I love to point out, again, that we're saved by grace, not by works. The Bible makes that clear, but we're saved for works. The Bible also makes that clear. Romans talks about it. Paul was the preacher of grace, man, that there's nothing that you can do to deserve heaven. But hey, when you love the Lord and you realize God's given it to you as a gift, that's going to motivate you like nothing else can. And you see him being a very highly motivated guy. The best way to find Faithful friends is to start serving the Lord. That's where you're going to find him. See, a lot of times people say, oh, I don't know anyone here. Well, guess what? Come early. Stay late. Try taking on some ministry, working out in something. You'll make friends quickly. The bookstore, there's lots of people you could get to know in there. The sound and video. Rudy is a great guy. You get to know him. He's a wonderful guy. You have fun getting to know him. The cafe, the outreaches that we have here, the prayer meetings, the men's group, all of these things. The ladies' group, there's a fishing trip. What kind of friends go fishing, man? That's wonderful, right? I mean, if you can find a friend who fishes, you got it going on. And you see youth group, all of those things. If I were to make a list of my closest friends, you know what? They're all people I served with, not just sat by. I mean, that's the bottom line. I served with them. I got up and served, and we found friendship there. We found fellowship there. And I'm sure those of you who are doing that, 
could say the same. You'd say, if you were to make your list of friends, I bet it's people you're serving alongside. And you see verse 10, it says, Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are the household of Aristobulus. Man, they just go on and on, don't they? Apelles. It means, his name means called. That's what his name means, but you know what? Paul said he's approved. It's great. He's tested and he's tried. That's what it means. And, and it's a word that meant to be proved genuine. So here's a guy who's called, yeah, but he's proved genuine. What proves a person genuine? Going through tests and trials. See, a lot of times, again, you'll have a friend until, well, not the end, but until things get a little bit tough. And then the tough got going out of your life, you know. But you see that those who stay, those that, that are there under the pressure, those are real friends. Not those who put you under peer pressure, under peer pressure, but those who are there and they are your friend when you're under pressure. Those people who actually help you in those things, that's the approval. That's what gets God's stamp of approval. And it did in his life. Now you see verse 10, it says Aristobulus again. You know who this was? This was the great-grandson of Herod the Great. Now, if you know anything about history, you know Herod was not great. He was a great jerk is what he was. That's what he was. He was wicked. I'm just calling it like I see it. And the one who ordered, you'll, you'll say the same thing, because he was the guy who ordered the babies in Bethlehem murdered in an attempt to kill Jesus. He was a guy who cared nothing about anyone. He was certainly not the kind of friend you would want to have or family member you would want to have. And so here you have Aristobulus from a dysfunctional family. But it says right there that some in the household came to believe. And you see in verse 11 uh, something similar. It says, greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Now, Herodian, again, named after Herod. The most dysfunctional family you could possibly find. Make the Oz... Uh, Ozzy Osbourne and his family look like, you know, Ozzy and Harriet. Narcissus, that was one of the words here. You know what that word literally means? Stupid. That's what I mean, stupidity, stupefy. The family of stupid. And he says here, it was also narcotics. That's where the word narcotics gets from, to make you stupid, Narcissus. And he says, you know what? These guys are, some of them are in the Lord. They maybe came from a very terrible background. I don't know who names their kids stupid or narc narcotics <laughs> named him little heroin that's my buddy you know you go wait a minute what kind of name is that and sometimes people talk so much about generational curses that's one i've heard a lot lately generational curses oh you don't understand i am who i am because of who they were you know and all that kind of stuff and i inherit those things and i can't get out of it that is not biblical jesus broke the generational curses. Any of those curses that are there, they're, the chains are broken. See, the Bible is absolutely full of examples of faithful people from faithless backgrounds. Absolutely full of them. And so you see these, just some obvious cases of people who came from terrible paths, but they didn't have to have a terrible future. See, forgetting what's behind, that's what the Bible talks all about. You see Paul saying, Philippians 3.13, forgetting what's behind... I press on toward what's ahead, the upward call in Christ. Nobody needs to be a prisoner of their past. That's what the gospel is all about. That's what Romans is all about. And yet Paul gives us some very specific examples about, here, about that here. Now, I'm not minimizing, minimizing the pain that comes from a messed up past, a messed up family. These wounds run very deep, and they can be something that we have to deal with. But you know what? God's run, love runs deeper still. That's the important thing to see. And there are two kinds of injuries that a person can have. A person has scars and they have open wounds. And you know, if you think about it, every one of us have scars. And we probably have scars from people in our family and our friends who have hurt us. It's just that simple. The closer someone is to you, the more chance they have of hurting you, the more opportunity they have. And so we all have scars from that. The, the problem isn't that we have scars because a scar is just simply a reminder of a past hurt that is healed. But you know, the problem is when it's an open wound. The problem is when you were picking at it and picking at it and picking at it and never giving it the chance to heal. See, we all have scars, but we don't have to have open wounds. Why? Because Jesus took those things upon himself. And the person who knows that they are forgiven can become forgiving. That's the way it happens. That's the only way it happens. Until I have the forgiveness of God, there's no way I'm going to be able to forgive the hurts that others have done to me. 
But you see these people being placed in new families. Maybe they had a horrible upbringing, but guess what? God gave them a new faith family. Isn't that beautiful? You can't choose the family that you got brought up in. You know, that was just the way it was. But you can choose your friends wisely, the Bible says. And you know what? The best friends you'll ever find are those you find following Jesus. Now, you see in verse 12, it says, Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord. You can picture them, I'm sure. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Now, these are probably twin names, and I don't think it's too much conjecture to say that, as you have Tryphena and Tryphosa there, and, and you all know some situations like that. Now, growing up, I knew a family. Uh, I grew up in a place called Boulder, Colorado, and it's a very weird place, and, and uh, there was a, a family there that had twins, and we knew them, and they, they named the second child, the one that came out second, one free, because they got one free. Now, you would say, that's not fair. What was the first one named? The first one's name was Fire Genie. Okay, so I think One Free got off easy, actually, in a way. But Fire Genie and One Free. And so these names, they mean something. You know, parents usually name their kids something that means something to them. And their names here in the Bible mean dainty and delicate. Dainty and delicate. You know, again, you can picture them in their little matching bonnet and their matching gloves and all the rest and their matching shoes and stuff. But look what Paul says. They labored in the Lord. And the word there specifically means to the point of exhaustion. I mean, some holy sweat. You see, dainty and delicate here, rolling up their matching sleeves on their dresses and getting to work. And I think that's awesome to see Paul recognizing this in them. And it's a thing that we see all throughout this chapter. Now, verse 13, it says, greet Rufus, the naked mole rat. No, some of you know what I'm talking about. That is from, uh, if you have kids, you might know what I'm talking about. That's, uh, what's her name again? Kim Possible, thank you. Rufus, okay, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. We would have called him Rufus the Doofus as a kid. I, I just point that out. But Rufus is likely the son of Simon here. Simon, Simon was a man from Cyrene. He carried the cross for Jesus, uh, Simon did. Maybe you know the story of the Via Dolorosa there, and as Jesus is carrying the cross out to Golgotha, he stumbles and he falls, he's not able to make it, and they actually put the cross on another man. They pick a guy out of the crowd, that's Mark 15, verse 21, and that was Simon the Cyrene. And several times you can make the connection between these, that Simon here, he had the son Rufus and they became believers as families here. So Simon might have made or had initially the idea that it was a terrible injustice. Can you imagine being there in the crowd and you don't even know much about what's going on, but a, a Roman soldier says, you, you're going to carry that cross. Well, me? Why does the bad stuff always happen to me? Why do I have to carry the cross? It's not me. I didn't do anything. And you see through this, though, this day that might have been the worst day of his life became the best day of his life as his family, as a result of all of this, comes into contact with Christ, comes to faith. You see, the best thing that ever happened to Simon and his family was maybe what he thought was the worst thing that ever happened. And you know, Rufus not only got to know Jesus, as you can see here, he got to be part of the faith family. He got to be personal friends with Paul. And this so much so that Paul called Rufus his mom, his own mom. He said, say hi to mom, your mom and my mom. Now, again, they were not physically related, but this is what he said. And if you piece together the accounts in Scripture, it's apparent that Paul lost many friends and family when he came to the Lord. He, he at one point, had to have been married. He could not have been uh, on the council that he was on in the Jewish society without having been married. So many say that he came to the Lord and his wife didn't want that. So he went on to follow the Lord alone in a way. But Jesus had promised, hey, if you give up friends or family or brother or sister or mother or father or all the rest, in this life you will have hundreds more brothers and mothers and fathers and sisters. Now what was Jesus saying? He was saying what I've said tonight, which is that the best friends you will ever find in life are those that you find when you're following Jesus. See, Paul had many mothers. Rufus's mom here cared for Paul as if he, if, if he were her own son. You can picture her saying, Pauly, Pauly, you look so skinny. Aren't they feeding you up there in Corinth? Let me send you some of my stew, you know? Or maybe pack a jacket next time, Pauly. You remember what happened in that dungeon last missionary trip? You know, it can get cold. And you can bet one of the reasons that Paul couldn't wait to get to Rome, he said, man, I, I, I can hardly wait to get to Rome, was to get a big old bear hug from Mama Rufus. 
See, you know, it's great to have a mom, but I think it's even better to have a lot of moms. See, I have a mom in Colorado, my physical mom, and I love her dearly. But, you know, the great thing is I have a lot of surrogate moms, some of them right even here in this room, who would make sure that I eat enough and sleep enough and all the rest of those things. And on those cold Miami days when it gets down to like 65 degrees <laughs> and I come in still wearing a shirt like this, you know, a Hawaiian shirt, they say, hey, Scott, where's your jacket? You're going to catch a cold, just like my mom used to say. You know, because a jacket is what you wear when your mom is cold. And so it's great to have a lot of moms. They'll keep you out of a lot of trouble in life. Now, verse 14, you see in here, greet asyncritus. Sounds like something that would happen to your knee, you know. I got a bad case of asyncritus. But uh, Phlegon, I don't, let me not even go on that one. Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philogus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus. That's a good one. I can pronounce that. And all the saints who are with them, greet one another with a holy, Christ, a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Now, that, that's a tongue tire there. Try reading that one fast at home. But verse 14 and verse 15, what you see there are some very common slave names. See, they, these names would not be common in other contexts, but common slave names. And, and again, I remind you that Paul knew some of the greats in life, and some of them are even in this list, but he also knew some slaves. And remember what Paul said the gospel means? There's no longer male nor female, Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free. We're all one in Christ. And he lived what he said. He lived it out. The common bond that he had with his friends, Christ. It didn't really matter to him what their background was from. And Paul never would have had such a great family of friends, such a diverse group of people that loved him and he loved had it not been for Jesus. And sometimes I look around in my life and I think, if not for Jesus, none of this, none of the friends, none of the family, none of the many riches that I could say that I have in relationships would have come without him. See, it all came through knowing him. I didn't have that before. And so verse 16, Paul even says, you know, he stops calling names here. He just says, I just greet everyone. Say, have everyone say hi to everyone. And remember, greetings are cultural here. You know, he says a, a holy kiss. Now, again, I don't want anyone taking this one and building a doctrine out of it. You know, but this was not entirely different than the Miami cheek kiss. You know what I'm talking about? I grew up in Colorado. We didn't do that. Maybe it was just too cold and we were afraid we'd stick together. But, you know... I, I, I haven't really fi fully figured it out here, if any of you wondered. I, I've lived here almost 15 years, and I still haven't totally got it. And several times I've almost kissed a stranger right on the lips because I went left and so did they, or I went right and so did they. I, I don't know what the rules are, and maybe some of you can help me with that. But at one point, I was meeting the family of someone who wasn't from Miami, and I went to do this, and the person, like, backed up in horror, and I almost fell right on them <laughs> trying to... You know, and they, they probably thought, boy, your pastor's quite forward, you know. <laughs> and it was just culture. But what's the point here? The point is greet each other warmly. Enjoy each other. A holy handshake, maybe. A hearty handshake, a warm welcome, a side hug, if you know what those are, you know. <clears throat> Not one of these kind of whatever ones that squeeze you. But Paul talks about friends and he, he warns about foes. So important. He says, you know, P.S., I love you. But he doesn't just say, I love you and everything's beautiful and nothing is bad and don't worry about it and everyone's the same and let's just all be one big happy family no matter what. See, the Bible says that love always protects. And Paul, because he loved them, wanted to protect them and he said some things that would. This is what he says in verse 17. I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses Contrary to the doctrine which you've learned and avoided them. See, he gave them a bunch of doctrine in Romans so he, they would be able to tell who's really one of the friends of God and who really isn't. You know, it's a very embracing and open thing. But when somebody's contrary to what God is about, if they're an enemy of God, they're an enemy of mine. And if they're a friend of God's, they're a friend of mine. And I don't want to confuse the two. See, he says, these folks in verse 18, he says, they don't serve our Lord Jesus Christ. What they serve is their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. What's he saying? Well, throughout this last chapter, the whole emphasis has been on those who serve. Those who serve God and serve others and love, all that. And he said, but there's some people who just want to serve themselves. They just want to serve their own appetites. That's what he's talking about there. Their own pleasures, their own passions, their own power, their own 
position in life. And they'll pretend maybe to be your friend through their smooth words and all the rest of this. But he said, they're really after you for what they can get from you, not what they can give to you. He says, those are people to stay away from. They need to be strategically ignored. That's what he's saying there. Just avoid them. And so verse 19, it says, for your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I'm glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, right there, that's the end, right? It says, amen. Wait, whoa, wait, there's more. There's more. Now, some of you are saying, oh, no, isn't it already nine? Well, it's one minute away from nine, and I'm going to step on the gas, and we'll see if we can get through even Paul's P-S-S-S-S, because there's some important things to see here. That Paul was surrounded by faithful friends in Corinth, that also wanted to say hi to him. See, it wasn't just a one-man show with Paul saying, I wrote Romans and here are all my friends. No, he says, there's friends around me. You can almost picture him saying, hey, I'm about to give this to Phoebe. You guys want to give a shout out? Anybody want to say hi? And you see, it says right there, verse 21, Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosiputer. <laughs> That's like a computer, Sosipater. Uh, my countrymen greet you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle. See, he actually scribed it out while Paul dictated it. That was a common practice in those days. It says, I wrote this. I greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host, the host of the whole church, they greet you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Cordus, a brother. So there's this whole group around Paul there in Corinth, and they're all saying, hey, a friend of yours is a friend of mine, and vice versa. We all want to know each other. And there's the high and the low. There's slaves. There's important people. And he says, verse 24, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You say, okay, Paul's done. No, <laughs> Paul's practice. There he says, amen, but there's more. He says, P-S-S-S-S-S, there's something else I got to say to you. You got to get this. And again, that urgency that Paul has, I have it here. It's, it's saying, hey, God loves you. This is something you can't leave this letter without knowing. Verse 25, he says, now to him who's able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now has been made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures has been made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith, to God alone be wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. That's the final one. Now that's really the end. But it's not the end of what I had to say. I have five more minutes that I want to say. So you can give an amen at the end of that. God is able to establish you. That's what he says. It means to prop you up. You can start zipping your Bibles because I'm not going to talk about anything else out of there specifically. But you see that he, he says some things directly here through the Holy Spirit. But you know what? God also props us up through the faith family. It's so important to see. Oh, yeah, God gives us strength and stability through his spirit. But guess what? His spirit is throughout the people in his church. And guess what? They were there. People are there to help us, prop us up. That's part of what they're doing. That's part of the strength that God gives and part of the joy he gives. And we live down in Homestead. And one of the great things about living there is we get to see some of the parables that God has put into nature. And you know, there are a lot of tree nurseries down there. And when a tree is planted and it's kind of weak, you know what they do? They, they stake it down, right? They allow it to grow because it's held in. And I saw once at one of these nurseries, they had them all staked down, but they also were tied to each other. They were cross-tied to all of the trees so that there was just no way any one of them was going to go down without all of them going down. And they would hold one another up. Now that to me was a beautiful picture of God's family. To just say, hey, we're staked to him and he's going to hold us stable. But guess what? He put us and planted us next to each other. And we're meant to be there for each other. And salvation was never meant to lead to isolation. It's supposed to lead to friendship and fellowship, a grace place, a faith family. And that's what this is meant to be, a friendship with God and a friendship with other. And I leave you with a story, which is that there was a man sitting in a rocking chair, and he was there at a gas station in a little, little town, and a car kind of pulled up in a hurry, and it had Miami plates on it, you know. And the guy pulls out, and it's not a very friendly place, Miami, and he said, hey, old man, are the people in this town friendly? And the old man leaned forward and said, well, why do you ask? And he said, well, because we're leaving Miami. It's a terrible place. Everybody there is a bunch of stupid jerks, can't stand them. We hated them. They hated us. 
And the old man smiled and said, well, I think you'll find this place to be exactly like the place you left. The man cursed, jammed the car in gear, and drove off down the road. Now, a little while later, another car came, also packed full of people and stuff. And the driver rolled down the, the window, and he said, hey, he had a little Calvary Chapel Kindle sticker on there. And he said, hey, excuse me, sir, is this a friendly town? And the old man leaned forward and said, well, why do you ask? He said, well, I just got transferred here from another place. God has led us out here and to this area. And, you know, this is the most wonderful place. And we had the most close friends and greatest family. And they loved us and we loved them. And I'm just wondering if this is going to be a nice place. And the old man smiled and he said, you know what? I think you'll find this place to be just like the place you left. Now, the moral of that story, I hope it's obvious, it's this. Proverbs 18, 24, it just says this. A man who has friends must himself be friendly. But you know what? There's a second half to that proverb, and I love it. It says something even more profound than that. It says there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And you know what? The closest friends you'll ever find, the best friends you'll ever find, are those you find following Jesus. But the greatest friend you'll ever find is Jesus. And until you know him that way, you'll never find the friendship in him that you need or the friends that you'll find in following him. And I have a lot of great friends, but you know, not a one of them died on the cross for me. Not a one of them. None of my friends went to the cross for my sins. Even the most faithful human friends that I, you might find can't take the place of God in your life. And even Paul with his friends, his many friends, he spent some lonely nights. He spent some times when it was just him and God and nothing else. And when times are hard and when friends are few, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and that's Jesus. And so we come to the end of this romantic love letter here called Romans. And we get the feeling that Paul didn't want it to end. He kept saying, amen, but wait, there's more. Amen, but hold on, P.S., hold on. And you know, if you think about that, I love the wisdom of God. It's like the end of Romans, it doesn't really end. It's like it keeps going, it keeps going. And God could have used so many ways to communicate His love to us, but he chose to use letters from friends to friends all throughout the New Testament. See, that's the New Testament. It's letters from friends to friends about the best friend that anyone could ever have. It's so personal. It's so real. It's so like God. And no matter what love a person has experienced or not experienced in their life, the Bible says greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their lives for their friends. And Jesus said, I call you friends. I call you friends. And so many might say to us, hey, P.S., I love you, P.S.S.S.S.S., I love you, I love you, I love you, infinity. You know, and, and I don't even remember some of the names of the people who said that to me or I said that to them back in junior high. But Jesus, he actually followed through with it. He actually did it. And the Bible says that he was the friend of sinners, the best friend any sinner might ever have. So it's a good question to think about. The names that are here in the last chapter of Romans, well, it's a great thing to be in that list, but it's a better thing to be in the list of the Lamb's Book of Life. How do you get to be there? Well, you simply accept Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior, and as your friend. And the best friends you'll ever find are in following Him. So I'm going to ask Pat to come up and close us in a song tonight. And during that time, I just ask you to consider... If you're brought here by a friend, maybe that's the best friend you've ever had who would bring you closer to Jesus. But if you've never really made that relationship where you say, Lord, I've known you maybe as a God out there somewhere, but I've never known you like a friend. I've never known you as the one who personally took my sin and is personally my Savior. I just ask you to take the time to do that tonight, just in a very simple way, opening up your heart to Him. The best friend you'll ever find is Jesus.